everyone. If anyone doesn't know, I'm David Caesar. I used to be a film director. Um, um, and I'm sure you all know Ben. Hello, everyone. Yeah. I'm going to keep playing that music. That's great. No, no, it's probably a good thing they're doing a little bit to start with. Them. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, I guess first up, we should, because most of these people I assume have seen Una, um, we should talk about that a little bit. Um, I was just wondering about how you take on a role like that, you know, which is such a dark place, such a... I mean, what do you think about when you sort of do, do, a, do a character like that? Um, the, no, it, I hadn't seen the play Blackbird, um, and um, so when I first read it, I, I found it a really thrilling read. Like, it was... Um, uh, it was a very intense psychological thriller. Um, but when I went to do it, because in the play there is no young Una, um, in this there is, my main concern was to, was actually just to get comfortable and spend time with uh, Ruby and her family. Because that to me was the only bit which was like, oh. Um, the rest of it didn't... Um, you know, like, you're only ever doing scenes and you sort of understand the parameters of the scenes, you know it's pretendy and all of that, um, which allows you to sort of really go for it, I think. But in, when it came to um, Ruby, um, who, you know, who was, was 13, I think, um, maybe 14 when we did that, that was the that was the part that that you know I just wanted to go and spend some time with her family and her just to go normal normal we're going to do sort of um, weird subject matter even though it's not anything specific when you see them together but that was my main concern because mm. yeah, I, I wonder do you, do you think about the context of playing a pedophile like in the context of your career or is that <laughs> not, not hugely. I mean, you become aware of it when you're doing. Like I, um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm aware that it's sort of, you know, that there, there's a sort of a, a through line of sort of dangerous or difficult characters and stuff like that. And I mean, that's prop That's why it came to me in the first mm. place. Is is because that's the sort of the work um, that's largely been going on in the last couple of years. But, I mean, I've mentioned this a few times before. Um, you know, I used to be uh, the sweet, affable, um, you know, couldn't get a girlfriend type of <laughs> guy. Um, and then, you know, we perfected uh, larrikinism. Um, and then it suddenly went to, you know, murderers and <laughs> pedophiles and Death Star builders. <laughs> So I imagine it'll be, you know, a doting grandfather before <laughs> terribly long. I mean, you know, it changes. So, but I've never ever confused me with the thing. And I think that's a normal thing that happens. You watch something and you go, oh, you know, oh wow, dodgy. But, I, you know, I mean, you know, I, I've never ever confused myself with, you know, the a script. Very good. Um, okay, so um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your career. And I, I sort of was thinking about it last night. I was thinking it's, it's almost like the model of a, of a feature script in a way. And like people talk about three act structure, but really now they talk about, they're actually talking about four acts. Uh, they make the second act two parts with a midpoint, which anyway is a lot of bullshit. But, and, and the Americans come out and tell us how we're doing, writing our scripts wrong and the government pays them to do that. But that's a whole other story. Um, uh, but we could take half an hour. I think you could take the whole afternoon, but let's not go there. Um, but I was thinking about it because I think like the first act of your career was this guy who was travelling around with his parents around the world and getting expelled from schools? Well, one, you know, <laughs> one, one, but that'll do. And then coming back and staying with your grandmother and then this ad for actors came along, was it? And yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. There was a, well, it was a friend of mine actually, it was my best friend from high school before I left and went to America. Yeah. Uh, had read an ad in the paper, they were looking for kids um, and it was ostensibly to do a show called The Henderson Kids, uh, which was for Crawfords and um, I went along, I did the interview, uh, you know, 
it went well. Uh, but the Henderson kids, for whatever reason, got delayed. So I ended up getting other little jobs for Crawfords and then did the Henderson kids. And then, so you did that for a few years. <coughs> but then yep. I think the big turning point into the second day. You're going to be right here. I know, yeah. I know where we're going. <laughs> yeah, it's the year my voice broke. Yes. Screaming later today in case you were <laughs> wanting tickets. Um, and for me, the, I saw that film and I remember I'd just gotten out of film school and I saw you in that and I was very impressed with that. And I and then you won an AFI award for that? Yep. And then I had just written a short film and I got some money to do that. And I contacted your agent to see if I could get you to be in it. And they said, yeah, he'll do it. And then I said, oh, I haven't got any money. Would he come up on the train from Melbourne? Oh, I haven't got any money to put him up, so can you find somewhere to stay? And Ben said, yeah, okay. And uh, we made a short film together. And you were still a teenager, I think? Yeah, I would have been. I would have I been. I think 19. Um, yeah, it was no, 18 or 19, something yeah, like that. 18 or 19. And yeah. I was in my, still in my early 20s. So um, we did that together. But that's kind of then when you, because I think that's kind of the first like larrikin thing that you did. Really? Yes. <laughs> no, um, no, no, no. Um, yeah, my voice. Oh, okay. I thought no, you I were. Yeah, I yeah. know. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> kind <laughs> of. Kind of. I think the Henderson Kids was actually. In fact, if you want to go back to it, the Henderson Kids was kind of a blend of a bad guy and a larrikin. So they must have pegged so me. So it's all a cycle. Yeah, they must have pegged me quickly. Okay. So then you went on to start doing all the um, romantic leads. Yes. Uh, oh, you want me to fill oh, in wait, that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, I didn't, I've never done a romantic comedy, so... Um, yes, you have. Have I? Yes, yes you have. When? Even in Mullet there's romance. I mean, in yes, Idiot yes. Box. You know, yes, you have. But so. I wouldn't describe Idiot Box as a rom-com. <laughs> No, but it's got rom-com strokes yeah, through it. Yeah, and it's got, like, musical elements. It does indeed. It does yes, indeed. You whistle the theme of Skippy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, anyway, anyway, so then I, um, uh, then I did, uh, The Big Steel. That's what we're talking about, isn't yeah. it? Yes. So, uh, wow, these conversations. Are they difficult out there for you guys? <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's, uh, you've got to... Gotta work it up here. Um, so I did that for uh, for Nani Taz, but funnily enough, she gave me that job because she had seen an episode of GP where I played a uh, a soccer player who had um, some kind of knee thing going on. Um, so I don't know how that happened, but in any case, at that, and then I kind of became sweet, um, forlorn, overcome kind of um, boy. Yeah. And and did that again in kind of Spotswood yeah. with um you know with uh, with Sir Anthony Hopkins and um, and you know a Rusty. bunch of uh, a bunch of great people. <laughs> um and that's sort of it. did I do oh, that's about it, isn't it? The the oh, no, I think there was a couple parts. more in there. Um, I, think, I don't know. Yeah, there's oh dear. Um, <laughs> and then and then I would argue, and yes. you, can tell, you can tell me I'm talking out of my ass here, but I would argue that then that next stage of your career was around Idiot Box. Absolutely it was. There's no doubt. Idiot Box was a big... Um, in fact, if I look back and I think back on the career, it's kind of like you get these sort of marker, you know, there are these marker pins, and Idiot Box is a very, very definite marker pin. And Kev is uh, one of my uh, one of my all-time favorite characters um, and uh, and in fact I was gonna play um what's his name what's the we you, you flipped roles on us yeah, yeah. why'd you flip roles on us because oh. I was going to be the sweet boy yeah. wasn't I the poet well it was kind of like a similar dynamic to the big end that short that we did yeah yeah and you were going to play one role and a different actor was going to play the other one because in, in the big end, you played the guy who was going on to university. Right. And um, the other character was wanted to get a car and go up to Queensland. Yes. Yeah, and so it was kind of like a riff on that a bit. And we're looking into that. But then it just felt, when we're doing, we actually were doing like chemistry reads. And a chemistry reads where you have an actor who 
you know you want to have in the film and then you get other actors in to see what the dynamic is, <coughs> to see yep. how it feels. And so we were trying it out and it just didn't, I don't know, it just kind of wasn't working in, in the casting process. So then we looked at swapping it over just to see what would happen and it just went like that. And as soon as we did that, well that was a no-brainer from that point on, I thought. But, but Kev was, can you guys hear David clearly enough in back here? You yeah. can, and you can obviously hear me because I'm loud. Um, um, uh, yeah, but Kev was very much, and Kev is in fact the, the, the most quintessential, purest sort of larrikin, oik kind of uh, character, I think, of them all. And I, can't, I really love him for that. And I love him for that. But there are those re references in it too. Bon Scott and, and Ned Kelly and, and we're kind of riffing on that idea too, that kind of self-destructive Australian iconic character with him. Yeah. You sort of embraced that, I thought. No, I, look, I loved all that about mm. it and then I remember I found that Girl Scouts um, zip-up top. Yes. With the patches on it. That was fantastic. Which appealed to me greatly. I, I liked it very much. And, and that ended up becoming what I wore. Yeah. Well, you'd let me wear that a bit. I yeah. wanted to wear that jacket a lot more in the film, actually. Yeah. But the problem was it coming up the get a dog up issue. Indeed. Indeed. Which was kind of the point in the way for me. Anyway. You see how actors can often get in the way of... No, no. It no, 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 no I, don't, I, mean, I mean this quite seriously. Actors can very, very often get in the way of the clarity that a filmmaker has. Yeah. But I, I made it more subtext instead of text, so that was a good thing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was good. I don't, think, I don't think people missed on seeing the Get a Dog Up shirt. I think they saw it. No, they definitely saw the Get a, get a yeah. Dog Up t-shirt. Yeah. And, and you barking at the dog and everything else. <laughs> That's right. I had to fire that dog up. So we're going to do this scene, right? And they, they got the dog wrangler. And I mean, in a, in, if you do a film in Australia, you have to have 60 advisors to make sure that the, the dog's okay and that the actor's okay and the grip feels secure. Um, and they got this dog that wouldn't fire up, you know? The whole point is you walk past this massive Rottweiler and he spins out and starts going rrr, 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 at you, right? And, the dog wouldn't do anything. He just kept walking. Uh, uh, walking up the fence. We go back and do it again. And I looked at Davey like, what the fuck is going on? And then eventually I had to go up and kick the fence, didn't yeah. I? Like, and do all that sort of stuff to get the dog fired up. And we still didn't get a very good performance out of it. <laughs> but you went on to do a bunch of other larrikin sort of roles after that, though, didn't you? Yeah, like what? Well, you were a bit of a larrikin in Cosy, were you? Oh, no, Cosy's very much back in the, you know, wide-eyed boy. boy of the world. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's very much. Mm. That's very much. But, yeah, what else? Mullet? Yeah, yeah, although Mullet's more of a... Yeah, he's more of... I think of him more as a spiritual larrikin. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I do. I think of him very much as a guy trying very, very hard to um, return and fit in. And I, I never think of, of Eddie as a larrikin, mm. ever. But I did get there. I mean, in any case, that idea that, you know, I was um, the Australian everyman larrikin thing pervaded for a while. Yeah. Until, well, I was going to say okay, cool. that, but in the great tradition of this sort of three acts, it was with really two, four, with, yeah. after the midpoint, um, that what I think was interesting in, in your career was that there's this thing that in sort of all the books I have now, and they call it the dark night of the soul. Oh, yeah. And it's sort of the middle of the second part of the second act. And there was this period in the early thousands when you sort of like, get a gig. There was no work. Yeah. And conversely, I was pretty happy mm. in that time. <laughs> like, conversely, I was actually quite contented. I lived up the road here. I had a lovely girlfriend. She had a beautiful dog. <laughs> and, um, and I spent about two or three years just walking around, you know, Darlinghurst, Surrey Hills with Tetsui the Sharpe. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, but there was no work. I think, I, yeah, I made nothing. For, a, for a, about three years. And there was a kind of a general drought. Mm. 
But then there was also my drought. <laughs> and then for a couple of years, she sort of played these quite, I thought they were quite dark characters and things like um, uh, Tangle yep. and um, what, was, what was the other one for love, John? Huh? The lo Love My Way? Love My, my way. way. Yeah. Well, Love My Way kind of, okay, so Claudia, this is another big pin in, in that sort of marker post of things. I had, by the time the 2000s came over and everyone was going, why don't you go to Hollywood like everyone else and go to Hollywood? And I sort of realised that, you know, I wasn't really going to get any love until I'd gone on and done some American stuff and then whoopie doo, you know, look, trust me, trust me, I know you fuckers, you're not fucking, you're not turning up, you're not turning up in these numbers without a Death Star in there somewhere. Stand, can you stand up for a moment? Ladies and gentlemen, I, I salute you. I salute you. So I'd been going backwards and forwards, right? And as John Paulson says, I couldn't get arrested there. Like nothing. Didn't matter how fancy, you know, I thought I was or this or that. They were like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I'd go back and forth and back and forth and then Claude said, Claude said, do you want to come and do this show? And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah that'd be pretty cool, you know, that, okay, great. And I came back and of course it was, um, you know, far, far better than, than you know, I'd, I'd realised at all and it really, um, it really kicked things off and so obviously, Love My Way then led to Tangle very, very directly, but also to other things like Australia, stuff like that. I mean, just the thing of being out there in something decent. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was <coughs> that was pretty much um, the start of good work again, although mm -hmm. it did then go nothing again for mm -hmm. a while after that. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of did a bunch of films kind of almost... Literally at the same time. I yeah. Think it was Australia, there was Prime Mover, there yeah. was um, Brownie's film. Beautiful Kate. Beautiful Kate. And Idiot. then there was another film. Yeah. There was Animal Kingdom. Animal Kingdom. Now, and... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that was a run of... That was a run of jobs. So that went boom, 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 boom. And Animal Kingdom was the last of them and I turned 40 the day after we finished. Um, and I nearly didn't do Animal Kingdom. Aww. Like an idiot. <laughs> like an idiot. Um, but, you know, knock the laminex, I think I did. Um, yeah, and so then obviously, and even after Animal Kingdom, right, which obviously worked as a film and it obviously sort of came together as a performance and everything else, and I thought, okay, good. Well, if anything is going to work, this will work. And there was kind of a there was a there was a kind of a one-two punch overseas because both beautiful Kate, where I'm I'm sort of a better-looking version, um, and then Animal Kingdom, where I'm probably a more um, uh, you know someone that gets your attention a bit more. Um, <laughs> They kind of worked together, you know, they went to Toronto and stuff like that. And then I went to the States and went, okay, f you uh, representatives, fire up. Because it's not going to, like, this is it. If this doesn't work, then, you know, nothing's going to work. It'll just be David C. And nothing happened. Channel. Nothing happened, though. <laughs> nothing happened. So I had to sack them. <laughs> but off the field, off you go. Uh, and it went quiet, and it was just like, okay, okay. And I'd spent a few years thinking about what I was going to do and stuff if it didn't all work out. Mm. And then nothing happened and nothing kept on happening. And then in one of those, you know, kind of classic, it seems to be the way that a lot of people actually get their sort of start in America. There was a film that had kind of formed up, and um, one of the cast members had switched around and dropped out. And um, uh, then I got this call one day from out of the blue from a very breathless Joel Schumacher um, saying, Ben, Ben, are, are, are you going to do my film? And I had heard nothing about it, right? I, 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 I was like, uh, I think so. I, think, 
is the big guy. Yes, John, what, what, uh, what's your film? <laughs> what, what is it? You know, um, Dan Wiley once said that, that actors are really like seagulls. Um, you take a bag of chips down and you, you know, and he'd throw them up in the air and he'd go, look, look, there's a couple of weeks in Neighbours. <laughs> We're all on it. And it's basically true. You get us hungry enough, you put us out of work for, for long enough, oh, we'll suit up. <laughs> was that, um, what film was that? What was that? That was called Trespass, which is not uh, one of the, the more well-known films of the canon, um, but, um, but it was, uh, it was a, um, uh, it was a home invasion piece where I played the home invader. Um, and uh, it was Nicole Kidman and Nicolas Cage. And it was because Nicole had said, um, you should have a look at that guy, that, um, that I got that job. So, cool. Nick. Um, then you went on to do a bunch of films that I thought were really interesting and, and in no particular order. Um, tell me about uh, your film with Andrew Dominic. I thought I, I really loved that movie. So Andrew Dominic, uh, Andrew Dominic and I have been uh, uh, best friends for a very, very long time. And uh, you know, we've been uh, one of us had been threatening the other with uh, gainful employment <laughs> for a long time. And he was doing this film in New Orleans, it was a Brad Pitt film, it was called Killing Them Softly. Yeah. And he, um, you know, he said, oh, you want you to do this role, I want you to do this role, I want you to do this role. Yeah, yeah, beauty, beauty. And then nothing came of it, right? Then there was nothing, absolutely nothing. Same routine. Um, and they'd had, again, a, some kind of casting debacle where someone had been cast and then was not cast and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, long story short, I got a very panicked phone call saying, uh, are you going to do my film? <laughs> um, and uh, I said, of course I'm going to do your film. I'd actually gotten another job by the time that one came around. Suited up, went to New Orleans and, um, and shot Killing Them Softly. Scoot and I, uh, for those of you who have, who have seen that film, Scoot is the lead in the film. And you remember, well, you better remember me. You know? um, we were sort of the bottom of the batting order in terms of, um, in terms of the status of the actors, which meant that we had to be there from the time the film started shooting. For those of you that don't know, quick interlude here. The, the more fancy pants you get as an actor, the less time you actually have to spend shooting any particular film. How it goes is, if you're, well, if you're Brad on, on a film like Killing Them Softly, you're gonna come in, you're gonna shoot for two weeks, and then you're gone. And they'll shoot everything, boom, 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 boom. And if you're Scoot McNary and, or Ben Mendelsohn on the same film, you'll be there for four months. <laughs> So we, so this worked really well for us though, because we were sitting around with a whole lot of nothing to do. We were in hotel rooms and we just went, why don't we just get a joint together? So we got a place and we lived together and that helped us to get to the point where we really were really giving each other the shits. <laughs> but we also really liked each other. And I think there's one or two scenes where that really pays off. There's a fight we have on the way to robbing the um, card game. And it's one of these things, you get stiffies about this stuff if you actually work in it. You don't generally maybe notice it if you don't. But there's, there's a, we're fighting so badly and my fight, I am so angry with him and he is so pissed off with me. Uh, anyway, so we had to work for months to get that uh, one second of film, but I was very glad of it. Good. Another film that really made a big impression uh, on me was a film called Startup. How did that come about? <coughs> Startup came through, um, that came through the agency, and I think um, David McKenzie, who, uh, who was a director, had, um, had, had a 
probably seen, obviously have seen Animal Kingdom and stuff like that. And this is a British prison movie. Um, and that, that's the one that for me was the riskiest of all of the jobs that I've taken on. That was the one that I worried about the most. And that is because growing up in Australia and being an Australian actor, the amount of furor that would have been unleashed amongst the fellow actors if some, um, you know, English guy had been brought in to play an Australian, that would have been a huge deal. So I went there like, mm, and I didn't know whether, you know, I didn't know whether I could pull it off, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I figured um, it was worth a roll of the dice. Mm -hmm. I'd heard someone once say that if you think you can do something but you're not sure, you should try. Like, if you, if you really don't think you can do it, okay, fine. But if you think you might be able to do it, go for it, you idiot. <laughs> so I did, and um, uh, uh, that, that film ended up um, way surpassing my expectations of what it was. And really, um, particularly in England, that mm. film was um, that film was very successful. So yeah, I, well, I think it was a really successful film. Um, and not long after, was it not long after that you did uh, uh, Mississippi Grind? I can't remember whether it was before or after. Like, mm -hmm. like the, some of the some of the order of these things. But uh, Mississippi Grind was the first time I got to do a lead in an American. And that was uh, that was huge too. That mm -hmm. was, um, and if if Ryan Reynolds hadn't have come on board, uh, that that film wouldn't have got made. And I'm very proud of that film too. Massively proud mm -hmm. of that film. And how did that dynamic work with you two guys on that? Because that was a really great. He's so easy to be around. Yeah. Yeah. You want to know my great analogy mm -hmm. that I heard yeah. once from a Qantas? <laughs> okay, tell me. <laughs> I got bumped up to first class, right? I, there was so, not because not because I'm excellent, but because I had a frequent flyer card and there was a plane overbooked and blah blah blah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was talking. I said, "Oh, it must be you know you work up here. It must be a bit you know." It must be, I mean, you yeah. know. And she went, "What? What do you mean?" I said, "You know, the, the people up in first class. They must get a bit like." Argh. And she said, "No. What are you kidding?" She said, look, here's how it works. In economy, great. You don't have to worry about a thing. In first class, they're fine. Business class, <laughs> that's where you got to watch out. Because in business class, they all think they're supposed to be up the front. <laughs> um, how embarrassing. My dad is FaceTiming me. <laughs> I'm tempted. <laughs> Hey, Dad. <laughs> Dad, you've called it a bad time. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll catch you later. Say bye to my dad, everyone. <laughs> See you, Dad. I'll talk to you later. Uh, ouch. Um, okay. Note to self. So, and that's actually my analogy of things, you know, like the, the, the counterintuitive thing about people that uh, do really, really well at what they do is they don't try and act scary or weird. It's sort of the people that, um, you know, in some way or another don't quite feel like they're where they're supposed to be, that, that, that hit you with a lot of attitude or are scary in some way. Um, and Ryan Reynolds is not that person. Ryan Reynolds is... You know, a man at the top of his game. Uh, he is funny. He's sweet. Uh, he's a very good-looking, uh, you know, solid movie star. He, and if he hadn't had come on board, that film wouldn't have got made. Mm. So it was very easy, um, you know. It was very easy to buddy up. Well, it worked right well on screen, I thought. Um, one of the things that I saw uh, uh, of you was that the you know, the G'day Australia Awards or whatever they were in Australia yep. really recently. Um, and G'day I'm, USA. G'day USA. Um, the, and, and I don't know how many people in the room have seen that, but I, I just thought it was a really interesting what you had to say about Buzz Aldrin and about walking on the moon. 
So, and there was uh, just... I pulled that one out of, you know, like that, that was a bit of extemporising. Well, that was pretty cool. I thought it was pretty cool what you had to say about that, about the idea of what it means to be, for an Australian, going over to a culture like the Hollywood culture. Do you want me to riff on that? I do want you to riff on that. Okay. Because it's your riff. It's yeah, no, life. basically what I said was, what I said was basically this, that the reason that um, Australians sort of can tend to do well, uh, you know, if they go over and they're actors or they come from our industry and they go overseas. Oh, that wasn't me. <laughs> uh, um, is, there's two parts to it. The first is that if you grow up, the Sports Illustrated did this thing asking why so many of the great, foot, the great quarterbacks come from small towns. And the conclusion that they drew was that when you grow up in a small town and you are, you know, you're the shit, um, you grow up and you take that attitude with you. And so to hit the top in, in Australia can happen fairly quickly. You know, you do a couple of jobs in, the ro in a row and you are, you're, the, you're the man. And I said it in, a, in the late 80s, I was, you know, for a moment there, in about 1989, I was the shit. <laughs> and then I said, the second reason we do well when we come over is because we think of ourselves, we're easy going and we're friendly and it's all bullshit. <laughs> we are ferocious snobs. And I mean this, and it's got really good, it's got really, really good, um, uh, you know, it's got really good payoffs, you know. It means that we're very interested in quality and in the integrity of things. It means we do make a better cup of coffee than they do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when you leave the social gravity of Australia, which is a lot of, you know, checks and balances, are you all right? Oh, mate, all of that. And you go to someone when people don't really care. They just say, oh, yeah, hi, hi. You All of a sudden, you feel like you can just jump, you know. So that was my analogy about man on the moon and Buzz Aldrin happened to be sitting there. And no one had said Buzz Aldrin's in the room. <laughs> and I was sitting next to Joe Hockey, who'd uh, <laughs> experienced something of uh, the Australian gravity. <laughs> uh, and he said, you've got to say something about Buzz Aldrin. You know, because he's the, he's the greatest explorer here, la la. So I did, and then I, you know, stitched that in. Did Buzz Aldrin actually walk on the moon, though? It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but if the analogy's about being weightless, then I don't know. Well, I think, I, uh, here's the thing. I think if Buzz Aldrin didn't walk on the moon, he should have. And he did. He did walk on them, because there was a third man, oh, and he was the one in the capsule. I just no, I had to remember, because I mean that so was. Buzz I wasn't class. expecting to get quite so. You know, I wasn't expecting that kind of grilling from him. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's. No, that's all right. I just saw Buzz Aldrin's business class, and the guy in the space shuttle thing was working. It was. Uh, I'm not sure that analogy holds up very strongly when you get to walking on the moon. No. I mean, it's giant steps. Yeah. I want you to. Yeah, well, yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. um, so, in terms of that process of like just going essentially, and, and you have pretty much gone from film to film to film, what happens when you get to the point where someone says to you, do you want to be in a Star Wars movie? I mean, you say yes. Is that what you mean? I mean, like, did, did that just all happen in a traditional way? Or did, was that a situation when the director called you up and said, Ben, are you going to be in my movie or what? And you said, oh, what movie is it? Or, I mean, is that it was pretty movie? much that. Yeah, no, I, mean, I got summoned to this meeting and it was at the top of one of those Beverly Hills, um, you know, motel things with a pool up the top and whatnot, and I knew that he was doing Star Wars, I mean I'd been told, um, and uh, you know I went up there and and I, I, Scoot McNary, the guy from Killing Them Softly that I talked about before, had made a film with this guy before called Monsters, a lovely little film, so I was familiar with Gareth and, um, and he had seen uh, Animal Kingdom and he'd seen Startup. 
So he then um, said, uh, look, I'm going to make a Star Wars movie and, you know, are you going to do my movie? <laughs> Basically. So, and that was that? No. Because no. <laughs> then I had to wait for, well, I didn't know. I, I sort of thought that was that. But then you, you, I had to wait a long time and there was no talking to anyone. Uh, and there was no, you know, and then uh, there were months and months and months went by and then finally, you know, we got into the, you know, the nitty gritty, like, you know, how much? <laughs> All that sort of stuff. I heard someone talking about the first time you're on set with a certain character dressed in black. <laughs> and I just heard a story about what you said to the director. He says it much better than I'm going to say it. Okay. But basically, um, when we had to do the scene with Darth, um, I was quite quiet and I was quite shut down. And, um, and I think Gareth thought I was very angry. Um, and I think he was looking over going, oh, what's going on, what's going on? And I kept sort of pacing and looking down at the floor and looking away and just trying to get my own sort of space. Because you do that on set a lot. You've got to go do all this really intense stuff. There's people around twiddling knobs and whatnot. Um, and you sort of got to find your own little sort of way to, you know. So I was doing all that. And then I, I went up to him and I went, Gareth, Gareth, come here, come here, mate, come here, come here. And I took him over into the corner and I said, that's fucking Darth Vader. <laughs> I, I don't believe you could have told that story better. Either. <laughs> yeah, Darth Vader. <laughs> I said it the other day, but, but it's worth saying, if you knew you were going to do that, you know, if you knew like when you were six and seven and people tease you and you can't kiss the girl and all that sort of stuff. You do just wish that you could turn around and go, hey, don't worry about it, Ben. One day you'll be in Star Wars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there'd been a lot of stuff I wouldn't have worried about. <laughs> a lot of stuff. And so now you've got your own line of toys. <laughs> oh, mate, I wouldn't say they're my own line of toys. Well, you were signing some on the way in. Yes, but that's not my own line. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I didn't. I was surprised when the characters all died at the end. Are they really dead? <laughs> um, look, I mean, again, I uh, I couldn't possibly comment one way or the other. <laughs> but there's a friend of mine who who I asked his opinion of it. And he seemed to think that, yeah, when the Death Star attacks a planet, that's pretty final. <laughs> okay. Well, stranger things have happened. Uh, look, you know, stranger than fiction, indeed. Um, but to the best of my friend's understanding, uh, yes, they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> so... I, I'm imagining you've got about four or five films in the can since then, because you seem to do about that many a year now. Yeah, you've looked this up, haven't you? You know what I've got in the can. Yeah, but the point, people are here to see you, Ben. Roger that. <laughs> um, so, so, so just tell me about some of the films that you've done recently that we can get excited about. Okay, the first of all is um, my, uh, my, my dear wife and I uh, made a film together which is a uh, romantic kind of comedy about a, a husband and a wife in the midst of a divorce that make a film uh, about two sisters and uh, two guys in LA. That's called Untogether and that'll be coming to your screens at some time in the uh, medium future. There is a Robin Hood origin story called Hood, uh, in which I play Le Sheriff de la Nottingham. <laughs> I, in fact, have this pinky ring on here. That is the sheriff's pinky. Well, it's one I had made. But that's his pinky ring. That's a big kind of action-adventure uh, Robin Hood story, origin 
story, mind I add. Um, then I did a, a lead um, for uh, a woman called Nicole Holofsner, who makes these beautiful little films. Um, and that is called The Land of Steady Habits, and that will be on, that'll, that'll go to Netflix. Uh, again, sometime in the medium future. And the one that you're waiting to hear about, which I've left till last, there's a new, uh, there's an exciting young director called Steven Spielberg, who uh, is making a film called Ready Player One, which is going to be a very um, beautiful, big, excellent, munching popcorn watching goodies and baddies go at it in, um, in the VR world, in the virtual reality world, with a lot of Spielberg references going on within that world, and that, uh, that should be about a year away. No, so that is, I think that's it, isn't it? That's it, isn't it? Yes, that's it. Can I ask a question just as a, um, you know, like a fanboy? about working with someone like Steven Spielberg? Of course you what, can. What, what, what is his process? Like on set, working with someone, with an actor? I mean, how, how do you say block out a scene? What's, what, what actually happens? Okay, so you go there, and, um, and uh, the gov, he's known as the gov. When you work in England, everyone calls him the gov, as in the, the, the governor. Um, so you go down and, and you... Uh, you see him and he has an idea of how he wants to move the scene and this and that, but here's what, here's what's excellent. You'll start doing the scene, right? You'll be going, you'll be like, Ben, I want you to walk from here and then you're going to come over here and deliver a line and kind of move on that line like that. And you'll go and you'll do it and you'll start doing it. You'll go, I do And then he'll go, oh, oh, I've got an idea, I've got an idea. <laughs> and he will start, this is what is excellent about him. He will start to then go, no, 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 I know what we're going to do. And he'll change it. And it'll change. And it'll, you'll sort of watch this thing grow and the camera moves and all of that. And his, his crew, his lighting and his camera crew are, well, they're, they're certainly arguably the best in the world. And they are so fast and they will form up and you will do these incredible moving camera shots that you've really got to be on your, your game for because the camera moves and the positions and the head positions and the intonations are so specific. He's, he's got a lot more in common with the very old-fashioned filmmakers like your, well, Billy Wilder, uh, Howard Hawks, those kind of people, than he does with, you know, anyone contemporary. The difference being that his camera an edit is so much more, there's so much more movement and energy in it than, than you could have achieved in those days. But the sensibilities are very much of that era for my reading of it, you know. But when, when you're working with him, is he giving you much in the way of sort of character stuff or motivational stuff? Is he talking about action is he, or is he much more about the actual mechanics? No, he will get in, no, he will, he will do... Like, whatever it is that sort of needs addressing, he will get in there and he will, he will mix it up. So he's able to talk about character and stuff like that all day long. But when you get something really good, you know, if you do something and he loves it, man, it's, that's a good audience. I mean, he is, you know, he will scream and he will jump out of his seat and go, that's it, that's a big movie moment. <laughs> and I mean, when he does that, it's just like, okay, what do you want me to do next? <laughs> you know? What do you want me to do now? I'm ready! <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think it's that level of enthusiasm and the genuine love and the connect that you feel with, with what you're doing and his response to it uh, and the degree that it changes. That's why, you know, he's, um, that's, yeah, he's, he's extraordinary. Mm. I, I, I often wonder, I mean, like, as a director, I often wonder about the processes of different directors because I, you don't get to see them, yeah. usually. And it always intrigues me that how... Because I would have imagined that Spielberg would have this incredibly elaborate storyboard and, a, like, plan to the 
nth degree, but the fact that he sort of seems to react on the day is kind of surprising to me. Yeah, well, it certainly... Look, I wasn't expecting that either. I thought the degree of technicality mm -hmm. in the moves and the camera moves and stuff like that would necessitate that, but they're an incredibly fluid. I mean, Mitch, his operator, is... You know, he's a, the camera operator. Um, he's, he's an extraordinarily, you know, I mean, he's he's awesome. They're, they're in, incredibly fast. They are incredibly fast at, at re, reorganising things and going. Mm. Yeah. So you're having this sort of incredibly purple patch at the moment with your career, you know, and uh, a lot of people, including myself, would say it's been a long time coming. Do you have like a ambitions behind the camera at all? Yeah. Oh, ish. They're more like pipe dreams. You know what I mean? I mean, mm. I, that there might be something I, I I do. But look, I really I love acting. It's it's um it, it's a tough day's work. Like if if it's really going and it's um uh, it is a tough and a long day's work and it is a difficult thing to sustain, you know, for many months at a time. But I um I am really and I, it's the happiest place on earth for me. Is mm. is a well working set mm. where it's all sort of going on. That's that's yeah. I mean mm. I, I mean, we I guess very lucky in that way to to really love what I do. Mm. So no, I don't have any any plans. Also, I'd, I'd just be worried that I'd suck at it, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean. Whereas I feel like, okay, I roughly know, you know, what I can do acting wise. I feel like, okay, well, you know, mm. yeah, I don't know what I'd do directing wise or producing wise or writing wise or mm. any of those other things. But has been a time that being an actor has taken a toll on you personally, like in terms of like. I don't know. Or has it just been more that it's sort of the, that sort of Australian <coughs> thing of not knowing when the next job is, not knowing whether you've got a future in the industry? I mean, that's kind of a thing that I know we've, had, we've talked about in the past. Yeah, yeah, we, we have. We have talked about that. Look, I think you don't... The, the, you, there's no job security, right? Mm -hmm. that, and that those, all of those concepts um, really just don't apply in... Um, in the performing arts, they they just um, they they're not that. So it um, look it, it's much harder work than people realise, or it's much much easier than than people realise at other times. Like there are certain things which are nothing; they're a piece of piss. But there are sort of there are things about it which require a lot of energy, and they require you to be able to you know, respond again and again. It's just the things that are hardest about the acting are the super basic things. Eating, getting enough food, because it's hard to eat. Once you eat at work, you sort of slow down a bit, and you're like, you know, you get your after lunch, and you're oh, I can go and have a nap now. <laughs> no. <laughs> Cry. <laughs> Cry. <laughs> There's that part of it. And it's just eating and sleeping. And once they sort of start to go out of whack, you can get pretty, pretty ragged, you know. But I, I think it's given me an enormous... I, I, I think, you know, I've drawn more of the bank account from it than it has drawn from me. You know, I think I've gotten, um, I've gotten an enormous amount from doing what I do. People uh, are pretty good to me on the whole. Um, and uh, it's all going swimming. So it should. I, I remember there was a time when we were, you and I were in New Zealand about 15 years ago. Before Indeed. Mullet. Yeah, just before Mullet. I remember that time a lot. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was, it was a really interesting time and we were in prep for Mullet and Mullet was up. And I remember I had a conversation with you about my reservations about the value of making movies in the world as a social good. And you had a really interesting perspective on that as far as as I was concerned, you were talking about it actually having this kind of infinite good, and you were talking about it in this incredibly positive way about how important storytelling was as a social good. Yeah. And, and uh, it was, and I have to say, from my point of view, that, that I found that incredibly reinvigorating. 
you know, like, and we were fishing for trout in that river in Queenstown, and Ben cooked it, and it was absolutely, well, he caught the only trout that he's ever said, and uh, he cooked it, and for me, it was fantastic. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 I remember back to that as being kind of a really, you know, like, that was kind of, because I was unsure about the point of it. Yeah. You know, and it was kind of quite invigorating to me to have your take on that. Oh, okay. Because really, you had a lot more experience than me in the, in the industry. Well, I, I had a different perspective, you know. Yeah. I wasn't someone that was having to come up with ideas and, and, you know, write and be responsible for the whole. I could more or less go on and shimmy my shimmy and hope for the best. <laughs> um, but I do believe that about, I think, and I, I also got told that very young. It's very easy to sort of go, oh, yeah, what does it matter, you know? Like, what are we doing here? We're not, you know... And it's a saying that comes up a lot when you're making films, you know? We're not curing cancer, you know, and this isn't rocket science. And that's all absolutely true. But when you think about it, for as long as we've been, you know, any type of a society or gathering of, of people, stories and, and storytelling ha is an uh, incredibly important part of that. Mm -hmm. And just to bring it back to our thing here in Australia and the never-ending kind of angst and debate about, you know, the state of the industry and should there be an industry and this and that and the other, I think that the benefits for Australia are much... It can't really be measured in, in strict dollar terms um, the ability to be able to culturally export uh, in the world is enormous. I mean, from as basic as tourism stuff to the idea of um, us in the world. And the idea of us in the world is still a pretty simple idea. I mean, um, you know, look, Crocodile Dundee is the most successful independent movie of all time and it, it had an enormous cultural transmission but that is for a lot of people is still you know that's when they think of us they think of croc dundee you know um so i think uh i just think that storytelling is incredibly important and i think we do have a unique voice yeah i look i agree uh, um but i i, I think as well that one of the things that's really great is is having someone you know I think that you you keep a lot of those for me the ideas of Australianness even in a lot of those roles you've done overseas and I, I always look forward to seeing a new film that you're in because I really enjoy seeing that quality you know yeah and I think it's good that it's kind of embraced and it's continued you know in your international work yeah, well, I think it's an integral part of, you know... Who you are. The, yeah, who I am, the way I sort of, you know, carry myself and do, you know, do my do. Mm. Um, that that is there, that is a part of me, and I, I'm proud of it. Mm. So when are we going to see you back here doing some more work, Ben? When you give me another job. <laughs> <laughs> Look, okay. I don't know, it'll be a couple of years, but I'll be... Don't you worry, you'll be sick of me yet. <laughs> Um, okay, um, well, we Bloodline. Bloodline. Yeah. Bloodline. Okay, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, shall I just take the mic? I, I think you should. Okay, You're so, so Bloodline, um, Bloodline came about um, because there are two brothers and one best friend. That's who make that show. Um, and they were drawing and they were talking about their own experience with... Um, th this guy who was a black sheep of their family. Now they had seen something of mine, I'm not exactly sure which one. Um, I think um, it, it was probably Animal Kingdom and Killing Them Softly. So they'd seen those two. And they got a sense that um, uh, the, that they wanted me to play Danny. Uh, and I think in large part that's because if you think about the animal, the character in Animal Kingdom, Hope is extremely dangerous, but you can also feel the sadness in him, and you can also feel the sort of, you know, there's more than just someone going, oh, I'm going to get ya. Yeah. Um, so they came to me with, with, uh, with the idea, and they had no one cast at that time, and it was going to be something, it was going to be on Netflix, I knew he was going to be 
you know, in the first season. So it was probably going to be one year. And I just went, yeah, I'll, uh, you know, they came and they said, are you going to do our series? And I said, yeah. And then, uh, you know, to my uh, enormous um, delight, um, I found out that Sissy Spacek was going to be my mum and that Sam Shepard was going to be my dad and I was going to have brothers and sisters that were Linda Cardellini, Norbert Leo Butts and the great Kyle Chandler. And um, we went and we shot that um, and uh, yeah, what a job. Um, so the, the effect of that um, one... Look, the Spielberg film definitely came off the back of Bloodline. He had seen Bloodline and um, uh, he had seen before it Animal Kingdom and he'd also seen Place Beyond the Pines. And so that was for him, that's, but it was very much Bloodline that, um, that you know, he was uh, in love with. Um, it, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, you can't... You can't overstate what that um, what that series did in order of, uh, you know putting me you know out there and um, just what an awesome and great show it was to to be a part of you know and and in the heart of okay great well we have to wrap it up now so I'd just like to thank Ben for doing this thank you. Thank you.